If this goes on, don't panic. Bringing hope to the world through speculative fiction. Welcome to episode nine. In this episode, we will be interviewing author and founder of World Anvil, Janet Forbes. So, Diane, how's it going? Pretty good, pretty good. Getting geared up for NaNoWriMo and, uh, you know, yeah, things have been going pretty well. How about you? Oh, yeah, pretty good. You know, um, as we record this, it is uh, nearing November. We're at the very end of October and it's getting cold out finally. And we're we're looking forward to being nerds inside, you know. Yeah, the whole family's like that. Yeah, we had snow and it stayed for a couple days, and now it's more typical of this time of year, which is rainy and gray, which is one of the reasons why I do National Novel Writing Month because it makes me right. depressed. <laughs> right. Uh, I I am looking forward to snow this year. I hope it snows. I I do love it. Yeah. Personally. Yeah. I love I love snow too. I do. I've never outgrown that. I don't care if it's hard to drive in. I'm not going anywhere anyway this year. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I do have some interesting news, though, oh. I'd like to share with everyone. Um, we we apparently are blowing up in India, which I found very interesting. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. Sure, sure. I, I, I guess I, yeah. Okay, I see it. That's great. <laughs> Awesome. Well, hello to all of our Indian listeners out there and welcome. Yeah, I was uh we we recently got fancy with our stats and I was looking and um we we have a lot of new listeners there. So that's that's really cool and uh if anybody out there would like to contact us, you know, uh, about their local science fiction scene, please do. We would love to interview some people from that um from oh, that community yeah. and see oh, yeah, what it's that about. Would be, that would be great. Yeah, please do reach out to us. We'd like to know more about what's going on in the Indian science fiction and fantasy community. That would be so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So speaking of communities, uh, you interviewed Janet Forbes of World Anvil, which is like a just a, basically a giant RPG, a RPG writing community. It's a world building platform. Right. I've met, we've mentioned it. We've talked about it before on the live shows. Right. But yes. for those who haven't heard other episodes, um, it's it's uh, it's designed so that you can set up your world for either, you know, a world Bible for yourself if you're writing in it or for like a fan wiki so that other people can read about stuff that's going on in it. And uh Writers use it and RPG designers use it. Video game designers use it. As uh, Jenna mentioned in the interview, actually, there's also people using it for things like their um, anthropology thesis and whatnot. Oh, so, that's so cool. Yeah. So, and, and this is the first interview that you kind of did by yourself. How was that? You know, it was really weird at first. And it was uh, <laughs> totally, it, it was... Uh, like a bunch of wires got crossed is what happened. Kat was going to be uh -huh. doing it with me and she couldn't get on the link and I didn't get her message until after because I was really nervous and I was concentrating on making sure I didn't screw it up. And it felt, it felt very odd at first, but I know Janet because we talk, I'm part of the, um, what they call the inner sanctum, which is a group kind of like a core group that uh -huh. gives them feedback directly on World Anvil. And in return, we get kind of the inside scoop about what's going on. And so I talked to her on a monthly basis as part of a group. So it wasn't like she was a stranger, which is right. good, right? And yeah, once once we got started, I settled down pretty quickly. But yeah, I was very nervous starting off, honestly. Okay, well, you know, now that you've done it, you know, we expect to hear more of them. Well, yeah, exactly. Somebody's got to help you carry the load here, right? 
I'm ready to I'm ready to hear this interview. Well, it, it, let's do it. All right, all right. So uh, here comes the interview with Janet Forbes. Hey, you all know that I'm a supporter of Dreamforge magazine. You might wonder why you should support Dreamforge too. First. Understand that Dreamforge is a new kind of science fiction and fantasy magazine that is looking for hopeful futures in a time when it seems hard to find that. Second, check out their magazine. The illustrations are beautiful. Personally, I was very impressed by the cover of the third issue. Additionally, they have top-tier talent writing in the magazine, like Jane Linskold, Dave Weber, and Mary Soon Lee. They also have new authors to discover, too. And if you're like me and read a lot on the bus... They have a portal set up for you, so you can read the magazine on your phone or tablet. There are plenty of other reasons to check them out, too. You can find them at dreamforgemagazine.com. That's D-R-E-A-M-F-O-R-G-E-M-A-G-A-Z-I-N-E dot com. All right, so welcome to If This Goes On, Don't Panic. We are here with Janet Forbes, who is one of the founders of World Anvil. If you haven't heard of World Anvil, well, you probably haven't been listening to the podcast, but uh, it is a world-building utility for authors and game designers and game masters and anybody else who needs to create a space where their universe comes to life. It recently made best sites of 2020 list on reader or writer's digest rather for science fiction and fantasy writers. I know it can be used for a lot more than that because I'm intimately involved in the community. So thank you very much for being here, Janet. I really appreciate it. Oh, it is my absolute pleasure. I love talking, world building, writing, all that good stuff. So thank you for having me. Awesome. Awesome. So World Anvil is kind of a runaway success. How did it start? It's a disgustingly sweet story, so be prepared. Awesome. Just like sick bags at the ready, all right. So I was, um, I was and do write novels. I write fantasy novels, and my favorite genre is epic fantasy, which has a lot of world building in it usually, right? Usually. So I was writing a universe with different sentient races and sort of sapient species and all of this world building, all of these places, law, gods, cosmology, ancient fallen empires and, and new zealot states, right? The whole shebang. And I had all of the details copied into a Google Doc. Uh-huh. And that Google Doc was 101 pages long. Uh-huh. And it crashed. Uh-oh. It crashed so hard, so often, that often I could just not access my data, right? And also because of the way that the information was, was sort of worked, because of the interconnectedness of the world that I had built, we all built, right? I would copy a section so that it would be in two places, and then necessarily I'd change one of them, but I wouldn't change the other one. So not only did I have a 101-page document that freaking crashed all the time, it was also wrong, like it was broken. And then it made my world broken because I didn't have a tool to do it properly. And my uh -huh. husband watched me struggle and watched me write down notes on paper because my Google Doc was not efficient enough. And I tried linking in other Google Docs and that didn't work either because I changed the name or of something and then it wouldn't link anymore. And it was, a, it was a big old drama. And finally he said, okay, let me help you. I will make you something. Awesome. And that was the start of World Anvil. It was, it was always made just to help me personally write my novels. Um, <laughs> and it was this insane, insane success. We, we never realized that, you know, there were other crazy people out there who also wanted to build worlds for novels and TTRPGs, tabletop role-playing games and, and all of the nerdy stuff that we were into. And yeah, so we, we put it up on Patreon thinking, oh, maybe we can cover the server costs. And if we don't, we'll just take it down and use it privately. And uh, yeah, I think within a month, we had thousands. Uh, within a few months, we had 10,000. And now we are almost, almost at a million users, which is completely wow. insane. And uh, that's not even, that's not quite three years into it. That's, 
that's wonderful. I, I love to hear runaway success stories like that. That's, yeah. that's so awesome. And starting from such a labor of love too, that's absolutely amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I still use it for my writing. I still use it for my games. You know, this is, this is a tool that we use every day for our own hobbies and our own creativity. And, you know, I don't think you can do it any other way. You have to, you have to make something that you love, that you want to do the things that you want to do and other people will find it. It's, it's just like writing. You don't, you write for yourself. It's the same with a, with a piece of software like that. The first user is you. You have to make sure it does what you want it to. And if it's been successful, I think that's why, because we are passionate about writing and, and fictional worlds and all that good stuff. And we just wanted to make something that would do the job it had to do, you know. That's amazing. Now, by your husband, you mean, uh, now make sure I've got the last name right, because I never hear his last name pronounced, but it's uh, Dimitri Havlidis? It's uh, pronounced Havlidis. So very, very Havlidis. close. Yeah, it's a Greek oh, name. Oh, I wasn't yeah. doing bad. Okay. You were really close. Right. Yeah, yeah. So Dimitris <laughs> cool. Havlidis. Yeah. Yes. Now, he was uh, and is obviously a coder software developer, right? You guys are, are full time working on World Anvil now, right? That's what you do yeah. professionally. You don't have other, well, other than you're a writer, of course. And uh, your pen name, I was looking it up, JD Blythe. That's right. Yeah. So um, I discovered that there actually is a Janet Forbes. And uh, yeah, there is even a JD Forbes, who was an 18th century scientist um, and may be related to me. There's a big Forbes cool. clan in Scotland. Uh, that's that's where my people are from. And so, uh, yeah, when I was picking a pen name, I was like, at least it has to be something that isn't going to land on somebody else's Wikipedia page. I hear ya. You know, I started publishing under my own name for my fiction, and I found out that there is a Diane Morrison who spells it the way I do, who writes Christian religious work. So oh. that's... <laughs> uh, yeah. But all right, fair enough. Now he does, uh, he's been a game master and a TTRPG player for quite some time. You guys run TTRPGs, uh, you stream them on your Twitch channel as well. So now what was he looking for? Like, I, I, I realize he created it for you, and I totally see that. But he also was building things for himself. So what was he looking for in particular? Well, there's a. There's a wonderful freedom about being a game master, but there's also a lot of a lot of difficulties, right? Because yes, you do some world building, but unlike having characters that you can revise their actions before you put out your story, a game master story happens live and you don't have control over the actions of the characters. That is your players, right? Right. So when you're world building, there's a lot of information that you need to have quickly because not only are you creating this world and sometimes creating it on the fly because they go places that you really didn't think that they were going to go. Holy crap. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you the made the choice, guys. You did this to yourselves. Um, <laughs> but also you're having to deliver that world building extemporaneously. Like you're improing world building sometimes. And even if you're not improvising the actual world itself, you're improvising the delivery of it. So all of that show don't st tell stuff that we writers spend you know, decades perfecting. Game masters have to do that improvised. How scary is yes. that? So yeah. what that means is you need really good notes. You need really good access to your stuff. You need to be able to find things quickly because you know you made a note about it two sessions ago and you need access to it because now they're asking the questions that you thought they would ask two sessions ago or they're asking the questions that you didn't think they would be asking and you're writing down the answers as you are telling them because holy crap, you better not forget this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so game mastering, it's a, it's, it's world building, but not as you know it, if you're a writer. It's, it's, a, it's a sort of different expression and it's got different challenges. So these are the challenges that Demetrius aimed to fix with World Anvil. It has a digital DM screen. So like if you're playing RPGs, if you're familiar with that, you have a screen in front of you where you can roll your dice, but it also has like cunning information on the back where you can double check what those rolls are. Yeah. You, we have that as a digital version within the software where you can have up all your own details and your own house rules and all of that stuff. You can check things, you can pull up stat blocks. So if they go the way you didn't expect, 
you can have a surprise dragon because you weren't <laughs> planning them to go that way, but it makes sense that there would be a dragon there. So surprise dragon, and you can pull the stats up for that in a second. So all of that really crunchy stuff, you can pull up and access really quickly. And you can also keep notes really easily. And you can also track, we call it storyteller seeds. So if you've hinted at something and you think it's something that you might develop, you know, when you're writing draft one and you, and you put something in, and you're like, oh, that's cool. I might turn that into, into a subplot. Game masters do this too. And they do it on the fly. So they need to keep track of those cool things where they're like, this could develop into a cool subplot. They need to write those down. So those are searchable as well. It's uh, it's really interesting doing both. And it's really interesting being in both worlds because you learn a lot the one from the other. But having a tool that can do both is kind of ideal, really, because then it, it does what you need it to do. Absolutely. I agree with you completely. I uh, I find that for me, what I tend to do is I'll, I'll create this interesting, you know, bartender or something. And then the, the characters, you know, the players will be like, so what about that bartender? And I'm like, uh, what bartender? So if I haven't made a note. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true. Um, there's a, a feeling among a more, I don't know, literary aspect of uh, genre writing that feels that RPGs, you know, you, you hear editors lament, oh, somebody sent me their RPG adventure. I'm like, look, you know, this is where you learn on the fly good storytelling skills. I know so many writers who are also gamers. Yeah. And I think that it's, you know, I, I think people should like back off of that a bit personally. So. Some of the biggest writers in, in the fantasy space right now, in the science fiction space right now, are RPG players. And some of those those big breakout success books, I'm looking at you, The Expanse, are mm. RPG stories. They, they were made as RPG campaigns. Um, there's a, a board game called Iron Rise, which is fantastic. It's a steampunk fantasy board game. It's a super cool board game. Start as an RPG campaign because it allows you and your players or you and your GM, depending on which role you're taking within the space, to explore a sandbox world. You're not having a story told to you. You are running around an IP and poking things and seeing what happens. And that makes great stories. Now, yes, they need to be repackaged. They need to be skillfully worked into a satisfying narrative. Now that that's and that's what we do as writers, right? We take a right. series of events and we turn them into a satisfying story. There is a skill to that. There that is there is a craftsmanship to that. And so I get why sometimes writers are like, oh, sorry, uh, editors will be like, oh, it's just an RPG campaign. It's a series of things that happen. And yes, that that can be a pitfall. And there are other pitfalls, of course. But what a way to explore a character, to live their experiences. What a way to explore a world, to run around and poke things and see what happens. Like, I see why it's such a great space to, to bring a piece of fiction, to bring a novel to life from. It's a very fertile ground, in my opinion. I agree with you. The Deed of Paxinorian, right? Won all the awards, right? Elizabeth Moon. I, I read it and I was instantly, oh, this is a first edition paladin. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Demetrius and I are watching a show right now on Netflix. I won't name it. It's um it's shaping up to be okay. We're curious what will happen. But um I turned to Dimitri and he was I was like, This is this just feels like an RPG and he turned back to me a session later and he said, I've never seen a party so split before. <laughs> So yeah, between the two of us, we're pretty convinced that this was A, an RPG campaign, and B, played by players who gave their DM a lot of grief. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, so as J.D. Blythe, do you do you write from uh, campaigns that you've played? Like, is that where the inspiration comes from? I'm afraid I haven't read your stuff yet. Um, one of... <laughs> One of the ironies of creating a wonderful world building platform that, you know, a million people can use and write beautiful stories on. It's got a novel writing software in it that is, I love to use. It's got a digital publishing platform in it. You can pull out things, you can link things, you can, you can promote your books. I don't have any time to write. It's freaking tragic because now, now, Diane, I have to run a business that I didn't think I was ever going to have to do. So suddenly, <laughs> <laughs> it is it is equal parts hilarious and frustrating. 
Um, I spend my days promoting writers within our community. I spend my days making tools and, and showing them to the world and showing them all the creative ways that you can write a novel and world build and sell your work through World Anvil and all of this great stuff. And I have very little time to write. I'm getting there. I, I have, feel your pain. I have several novels in various draft stages. Um, I've done a little bit of work in the in the RPG writing space as well. Um, some stuff I can talk about, some stuff I can't. So um, I released sure. with the artist Kaora. I released a, a we call it a a micro setting. So it's a little pocket dimension as a sort of uh, system agnostic RPG setting. And that was wonderful fun and has been received very well. People really enjoyed it. I'm involved in a few projects I can't talk about as well, but uh, again, they've been an amazing amount of fun and that they will be coming out. And then I have a bunch of novels that are in various stages of drafting, but it's right. just finding the time. It's finding a condensed amount of time to work on them all together so that I can get them ready for querying, which is, is kind of where I'm going. And honestly, every time Demetrius and I go on holiday, I redraft a book. That is, that is what I do. Uh -huh. Demetrius swims in the pool and I redraft a novel. Uh, <laughs> it's a little bit tragic, but uh, it's what I want to do. So it's, it's nice. And um, yeah, we're, we're hoping now we're at the three-year mark with World Anvil. I will have more time for writing. So hopefully you will see things coming out soon. Um, but one thing I have written was heavily inspired by TTRPGs. It was um, published by Kynite Publishing in their anthology, and it will be coming out in, um, as a sort of primer piece on, in World Anvil publishing platform as well. And that is absolutely lit RPG, absolutely 100% lit RPG. It's uh, set in the world that uh, Demetrius is in, is, is, is creating. And um, yeah, it's, it's a space that I find very inspiring, but I really don't enjoy writing cliches. So I think when yeah. I write lit RPG, it's not always recognized as lit RPG because I step so far away from a lot of the original inspiration that it's not always sure. readable necessarily, but I know where it's coming from. <laughs> well, I think it's a lot like when you're going to adapt a book to a movie, right? It's a completely different medium. You have to change how you present things. The order of things has to sometimes be altered. You can't include all the characters that you originally included, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So. And you have to find different ways of conveying your message because as any linguist knows, when you translate some things are not translatable and idioms are different. And it's the same in storytelling. What you describe as a, as a character set of character thoughts cannot be put on a screen. You have to show that differently. And what you see on a screen that is, you know, taken set directors 52 hours to put together, if you write all that down into your book, your readers are going to put it down because it's too much set dressing and not enough, not enough go. So yeah, it's, it's different methods of telling the story, but I think as long as you remain true to the message of your story and you convey what you want to convey, then, uh, yeah, you're, you're doing well by your story and your readers or your audience will, will enjoy it, you know. Absolutely. You guys have a very interesting history and background, one might say writer's resumes, that seemed almost to perfectly come together to give you the set of skills needed to do this work. Do you like, do you want to tell us a bit about that or would you rather not? It's, you know, it's totally up to you if I make you uncomfortable. Like you used to be a professional opera singer for one thing. That's right. So, um, yeah, my, my background is, is very interesting. So my parents are both archaeologists. So I've spent a lot of time, you know, researching the past, reading about the past and uh, literally being elbow deep, digging up the past. So as well as this big focus on the past, which has, of course, given me all of this insights into like, how did the world work and why did things work as they did and how do systems of government work and nations rise and fall and empires get built and, you know, different customs and all of this stuff. Yeah, there's also all of this music training, like professional talking about stuff and professional singing and stuff. I, I guess I never thought of it as, as useful except in the world of music, but then I realized that I have all of these transferable skills like, you know, organizing projects and, and um, organizing uh, concerts is surprisingly similar to organizing projects for a business. Um, invoicing. Invoicing is the same in, in every industry and, you know, all of that bookkeeping stuff. 
but yeah, I've just, I've always been fascinated with the written word. I've, I've written forever. Like I was the nerdy kid that was writing stories while everybody else was playing dodgeball or whatever. You know, I was, I was the nerdy kid that got their essay published in the school magazine or whatever. Like I, that's, that's always been me. I've always been passionate about writing. And even when I was a musician, when I wasn't on stage, I was literally in the green room, dressed in an Elizabethan costume, writing a fantasy novel. I, I lived I that it. life. It was completely crazy. So I would I would be wearing this massive tangerine colored costume because I'd just come <laughs> off stage with a giant spiky hat. <laughs> and I'd be just sitting there typing on my iPad because I, I wanted to write. And that's, you write when you have time to write, even if that's, you know, between acts in a show. You bet. Um, I did literally, I think, a third of my first NaNoWriMo project on my BlackBerry. Wow. <clears throat> Waiting in doctor's offices and chiropractors and to pick up the kids from school. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I would I would write on the iPad and then I'd have World Anvil open on my phone so that I could reference my world. That was literally how I was writing books um, the minute I had World Anvil. I, I did a lot of music teaching, as is common for, for musicians. And again, I would, you know, between lessons, I'd just like crack out half a scene really quickly um, <laughs> on my phone. Like you write when you have time and it's, yeah. But yeah, it's, um, so from that, that side, it's been weirdly transferable skills, but also Demetrius has been, you know, telling stories and world building and game mastering since he was about five years old. Like he's always been so passionate awesome. about it. And as a developer, his, he, he's one of these ridiculous people who is good at everything. I won't bore you with the details, but because he has, you know, ability to do the back end of design and also the, um, sorry, the back end of, of coding and also the design side on the front and also he's a passionate world builder and also he's very good at information hierarchy which is all about you know organizing your information what the hell do you need for world building it's organizing your information right it was a perfect storm of skills that came together um somehow and yeah i mean i guess these things happen sometimes i do i am aware that we are an anomaly like it, it <laughs> yeah, is I'm sure. it is weird like, I'm very glad that there are so many people who find it like, such a useful tool. We get these wonderful messages every day from people saying saying how great it is, which is, is wonderful for us because it, you know, what can you want from life except to make the world a slightly nicer place? So we do that for people and that's good. But yeah, it is it is a little bit crazy. We, we, we call it the three-year sure. roller coaster. Yeah, three years seems amazing to me. I have to tell you honestly, right? Like, Okay, so I joined World Anvil last year after National Novel Writing Month. It was, I've told the story before, but it was a present I gave to myself because I finished in a personal record time. And I was going to join at the journeyman level, but there was a sale. So I joined at the master level yeah. and I've just been upgrading ever since because <laughs> it's so cool. <laughs> and now you've got this manuscript software. And to me, this is like the best of Scrivener and Word with none of the crap you don't need. And I think it's amazing. Like, and, and you, you can do it anywhere. You can pull it out on your phone, just like, you know, and rather than waiting for the cloud to load and is it going to corrupt my file, which has happened twice for like no. huge novel file. Oh, yes. Yes. I've lost about 20,000 words of text in a couple of those. Yeah, it was terrible. Oh, my God, you poor <laughs> bean. I'm so sorry. <laughs> was that so with Word? Now. Yeah, yeah, that was with Word, screwing up on loading Dropbox because I happened to be moving from one Wi-Fi setting to my phone data and when it was saving because it takes forever to save. Yeah, I'm not having this problem, right? I, I remember that Dimitri said that the whole site, everything on it is backed up on eight different servers yeah. around the world. I'm yeah. like... I'll never lose anything again. Oh my God. Plus it's got auto save. Yeah. I mean, for a lot of people, that is the draw. So um, again, like I say, we have people who use it uh, publicly for everything. And we have people who only, only show stuff that they want their readers to see. And we have people who use it completely privately. Um, and in, in all of that, we also have some big gaming companies. We're under NDA, so I can't tell you who they are. Um, yeah, yeah, but we have like enough. big computer gaming companies who use it to organize their IP because, you know, these, these companies are massive. They have big teams with writers that they bring in to do various bits of the stuff. And then they, they sort of remove them from the project so they, they don't see it anymore. 
And so, you know, we have to have this the industry grade Uber, Uber backups, Uber security, all of this stuff. And so, of course, we do. Um, and I think any writer who's any ever lost any hard written work knows that feeling. It's awful. And that's why we're that's why the cloud-based solution is, is so good. And that's why we, we thought, okay, well, with World Anvil, the cloud-based solution is how we're going to do it. Because, yeah, there's backups with backups with backups. You're not going to lose something unless you actually delete it yourself. So, yeah. And actually, in manuscripts, there is no delete. When you, when you trash scenes, they just go into, you know, a giant, a giant pile that doesn't exist, if you see what I mean. Um, but it's, it's there, so you can pull things out. And I think that's really good for writers because we often... We, we savagely delete things that then we have delete yes. regret. Yes, I keep telling people over and over, never delete anything. Put it all in a you know, file you never look at, call it junk, but you may want it later, so don't ever. Yeah, absolutely. But we don't have to with this. You just put it in the bin and then you can pull it out anytime you want. I love that. But I mean, one of the, one of the benefits of having such a big community and um, having such a close community, because yes, okay, we, we've got a million people using the website more or less. But the big thing is that we have a, a very big Discord community that we can talk to every yes. day. We have a council of people that we talk to once a month and say, how is your experience? What do you want to add? What isn't working like you would like it to work? Um, and so we can get all of this feedback. We can get when, when writers say, I want it to do this. Why isn't it doing this? We can say, let's make it do that. And that is so valuable to pull all of that experience from our community and put it into the software. So it's exactly what writers need. And, you know, that, that's really helped us make sure that it's the tool it needs to be. And as people, Absolutely. you know, as people use the tool and they do groundbreaking things with it, because my God, they are. They'll come up against new things that they want it to do, and we can make that happen. And that's awesome, because it means that we can really build exactly what people need, not just build it for the ideal writer, but build it for actual writers who are actually using it. It's fantastic. I've got to say, uh, my patrons personally have never responded better to anything that I've done than the stuff I do on World Anvil, because it just makes it so easy oh, and you know, it's so beautifully presented. Yeah, it's it's really amazing. I've got one of the, you know, not the highest level tier, but I have a higher level tier and it's all completely paid for my, by my patrons. Amazing. Completely. Amazing. That is really good to hear. I think it makes such a difference. Like yeah. we spend so much time as authors thinking about our cover and thinking about our blurb text and thinking about our first chapter, those first impressions of a book. So when you have a Patreon, it's easy to forget that. Like you can, yes, you can just deliver a PDF that's ex exported from a Google Doc or whatever. Yeah, you can. That extra mile that, you know, oh, it looks beautiful. Oh, it's got images in. Oh, it's all cross-linked. So you can refer back to last month's Patreon rewards as well. And it's all together. I think um, it's just that, like that extra experience. It's like the first class experience for your readers, which is, is awesome because yes. it means, you know, you're, you are presenting your world in the best way, in the most immersive way. And you can also use it perf uh, completely privately. So you could use it for a series Bible if you're just trying to keep track of what's going on or a book Bible in, in your head. Or you can use it as a wiki, right, yeah. for your fans and readers. Or you can do both and keep some things secret and some not. That's, that's Absolutely. awesome. Absolutely. Honestly, I mean, right now, as, as we said, I have no time to publish anything. So um, I write publicly in my husband's world, which we co-author. Um, right, right. But all of my IPs are completely private right now because I've not yet released the books. And I don't want to tease too much world building unless I, until I at least am sure that it is going to be canon, right? Because if I go in and change things to make the plot more exciting or I decide, you know, these people can't do that anymore or whatever, I, I don't want that published before I'm ready to start marketing my book, whichever way I go with that. So I use it completely privately for now. And it's fantastic. It just like I can find things even when I call it something different here and there because I just write right. an adjective close to it that I know I used and it's pulled up from this database. Like it searches the entire Amazing. database and finds every single place that it's mentioned, except it's not all in a Google Doc that's 101 pages that crashes, right? I use it privately. Or a bunch of, you know, notebooks 
Oh and you had to write God. out with pen and paper in a stack and which of these five notebooks has the information and where is it? You can lose yeah. a day. You can lose a day. I have lost so you much can. writing time before World Anvil just searching different documents to try yeah. and find the piece of information that I know I put down somewhere. It's it's heartbreaking. And you, you get so frustrated with yourself because you're losing valuable writing yeah. time. And, you know, you heard I was writing in the green room and dressed as an Elizabethan woman. I was writing, like, in the bathroom on my phone between uh, teaching appointments. I didn't have yeah. a lot of writing time. I don't want to be losing that writing time because I can't find yeah. my stuff. But, again, like, being able to show things publicly, readers love it. Like, if they are reading your world and your – if you're reading your books and your books are sci-fi, fantasy, historical fiction, speculative fiction – you know, alternate earth, any of this stuff, they're reading it partly, they're reading the genre because they want to get immersed in your world. And giving them the option to go and immerse themselves a little bit more is just going to make them fall in love with your world and want to buy the sequel, right? Like, it's it's a no-brainer. Okay, so when I first uh, came to the website and I'm like, okay, I'm going to get this for myself, right? The thing that absolutely sold me was... We are not an evil megacorp. We are a young couple just doing our best, right? Um, you've changed the wording since then on the landing page there, but the sentiment is the same. You guys are very personally involved with this whole process, even with almost a million users, only three years in. You guys don't have a huge staff. There's no big corporation, you know, your uh, feedback is very important to us. We'll get back to you never. You know, you never. we never get that, right? We get personal messages. I'm so sorry from you, right? Or from Dimitri, right? Saying, I'm so sorry you've had this problem. We'll fix it, right? You've got a, a streamlined method of reporting bugs or, or, you know, requesting features. It's the same platform that you guys use to do it. So you take both just as seriously, And around that, you guys have built this amazing community. And this is something I really wanted to talk about because this is, I've never seen anything like it. This is something I've been looking for. You know, when you're a nerd, as I'm sure you know, you're always looking for places to belong. Yes. You, you, You go, okay, well, these people are different. They're like me. And you get involved and then you realize... Oh, somebody's got some ego issue and they're breaking the whole thing because, you know, yeah, you've sure. been there, right? Yeah. You're not seeing this, right? We don't get this in World Anvil. There are occasionally people who gripe a little bit, but the community itself is solid. I would really like to know what's your guy's secret for building this beautiful place on the internet? So it turns out that you guys are awesome. Like, nerds are awesome. World builders are awesome. Like, I think that's the secret is that, you know, you're really awesome. I think it helps. So I think in a lot of communities, uh, and you see this, like, this is amplified in places like Reddit and YouTube comments. It's so anonymous, right? It feels like, it feels like a victimless crime if you leave a, a trolley comment or whatever. Um, And I think for us, we've always wanted to be involved with a community. That's the really fun bit. Like, there's always boring bits and good bits to every job. And there are plenty of boring bits to running a business. There's plenty of, you know, paperwork and that kind of stuff that we have to do. You know, anyone who runs their own business, whether it's a writing business or a world building business or a bakery, they know there's, there's paperwork and there's boring stuff. But the fun stuff has always been interacting with the community, watching what you guys are doing with this, this like big bundle of creative tools, reading your worlds, engaging with you about your IP and, and like really celebrating world building and writing and gaming with you guys. That's always been the fun bit for us about World Anvil. Sure. Apart from actually getting to use the thing and write books and play <laughs> games, right? right? So we've always been very, very present. We stream three times a week from our house. We actually work from our house as well because we do this full time and so there's, there's in the team, there's, there's two of us that are on full-time staff. And then we work with a lot of freelancers and people who do just a little bit or they do part-time or this kind of stuff because we're a, we're a big old team and we, we believe in, you know, bringing people up through the community. The people who work with us, all of our freelancers and part-timers, they are absolutely passionate about World Anvil. They use and know World Anvil, which for us is really important, right? Because it's a it's a niche product and they need to know what what it is that they're, 
working with, whether they're doing, you know, helping people in support or they're writing blogs or whatever. They need to know exactly what it is because it's, it's, it's awesome and niche and weird, right? So everybody on the staff is personally invested. This is one thing. Yeah, absolutely. They, and they use it. We, yeah. we know them personally. We chat with them. You know, we, we hang out with them. We, we talk to each other. Uh, but also we are very open. And I think that's the other thing that is really important. If something happens, we will tell you. So earlier in the year, I had a surgery that didn't go very well. Um, and there were a few yeah. complications. And I was really open with you guys. I was like, guys, something, something's going to happen. We did this big challenge and we were supposed to have an award ceremony for it. And I, you know, I out and out showed you a picture and says, guys, my face is a balloon. Yeah. But, you know, we're never going to, we're never going to tell you guys something that's, that's rubbish. And we're never going to sweep something under the rug. We are, we are completely ourselves with our community because I think we are all kindred. We all have this wonderful thing in common and we all want World Anvil to be cool. And that's the thing everybody has in common. Everybody yeah. wants to use this tool set. They want it to be the tool set that they need to do the thing, right? Whether the thing is right. building a world for themselves or releasing a graphic novel or selling their books or just running a cool RPG campaign. So I think, yeah, I mean, being really genuine and being really open with your community, I think it's so important. And that's something that Dimmy and I have always, I'd say, tried to do, but, you know, started by accident because we didn't know any other way. And it just, so if there's any secret to success, as it were, it's, it's that, it's just, you know, be genuine. Don't bull crap people. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear. Don't bull crap people. Yeah, you can swear. Right, don't fine. bullshit people. Um, <laughs> Say it how it is. And if if your motives are genuine, if you really if you really just want to help people, which is what Demetrius and I want to do, then I think people will pick up on that. And of course there will always be a troll under the bridge. There'll always be somebody who comes in from Reddit and says, Why isn't this uh, blah, 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 whatever it is that they want it to be that it's not? But yeah, sticking true to who you are and what you do and be just being genuine with your community, I think. At least, at least they know that you're not, you're not bull crapping them, right? And so that's how we've managed it because we didn't know any other way. And we have been just really lucky with our community. It's worth saying as well, we have incredible mods in our Discord. We have that's a fact. wonderful enchanters. We have um, our inner sanctum, our sort of close enclave, is uh, our, every single one of them freaking heroes and everybody on the right. server, everybody on the website, everybody on Twitter or on Facebook who's part of World Anvil wants World Anvil to be cool so they can use it. So we all have something in common and we all love world building. So, yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. It looks like we're uh, kind of running short of time. So I'll ask the kind of, you know, last questions that we tend to ask. To start with, what's something that you wish people would ask you guys about more that they never do? when they're doing these kind of things? That's a great question. I'm not sure. Um, oh my gosh, I can't think of anything. We get asked such a diverse range of questions to how did you think of it, to how do I world build, to what's the coolest world on World Anvil, to what does... Here's, here's my least favorite question. What, if, okay. what will World Anvil look like in 50 years' time? And I'm always like, well, can you imagine <laughs> the internet in 50 years' time? What is even that going to look like? Yeah, no, I can't think of a question that nobody's ever asked. We, we, we do a lot of interviews. We, we get asked a lot of questions. So I can't think of one that nobody's asked me before. But if you ask me one, I will let you know that it's the first time. Okay. Okay, that's cool. You know what? I Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this in there. I know that lots of people are using World Anvil for things that are not world building for science fiction, fantasy, and related. What are some of the really interesting things that people are doing with it? Well, one of the really cool things, um, nice question, by the way. One of the really cool <laughs> things is that uh, we have a lot of university professors teaching world building using World Anvil. So um, the two that come to mind from the top, off the top of my head are Brunel University in the UK, in London, and uh, Rochester Institute of Technology in New York. They both use World Anvil as their method for how to world build, how to teach world building for game development, for writing. So I think that's really, really cool as an application. That we, is fantastic. We have yeah, yeah. Um, at least one person. Now, of course, I, I don't know what everybody's doing with it, but um, I know of at least one case and probably more 
people who are using it to organize their academic research. So we have um, anthropologists and archaeologists using it to essentially model the historical world or model cultures. So they, they create these interconnected um, article chains about sort of traditions and rituals or about artifacts and where they were found. They use the interactive maps software to, you know, show the different technological, um, the, the, the different sort of technical drawings of the sites and the location of the site within the region. And within that site, they show where different artifacts are found and then they can layer different um, impressions up. So, for right. example, they can use... Um, satellite footage and then they can use an artist's impression and they can lay those over so you can swap yep. between the layers and see the same stuff so you can see okay well this artifact was found here and this is what it looks like now and this is what we think it looked like then and this is what it looked like before we excavated and this is what it looked like after we excavated so there's a lot so of different using applications that interactive map uh uh, software that you've got going on there because that's fantastic too I have to say yes yeah. really makes it easy and we have a yeah. lot of sort of um, people who are doing things like linguistics and sociology uh, we have one professor using it to track things like languages and accents and um, speech patterns and the different places Indeed. that these are spoken and where they're heard and all of this kind of stuff within a city and then she's looking to oh, okay. widen the project to several different cities within the UK. So you'll be able to like go to the UK map and then click on different cities and see where these different languages and speech patterns and, and accents are being heard and have them represented with different pins. So you start to get this sort of interactive visual understanding of the, the linguistic topography, essentially. It's, wow. it's crazy cool. She's, she's a very, very bright button. She's a very, very cool lady. And uh, yeah, her work is really, really awesome. I love languages. That's so interesting to me. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, essentially, because it's it's a database system which uh, supports interconnectivity of information, the world's your oyster, really. You can use it for whatever you want. <laughs> awesome. Okay, two last questions. One is, and we ask this of all of our guests, what is giving you hope right now? I know it's a springer, isn't it? People usually have to think about it, and that's fair. What gives me hope? I think we write worlds because we want to show something to the world. We write stories because we want to convey a message, even if we don't think we're conveying a message, even if we just mm -hmm. even if we think we're writing about dragons. Everything is is infected, as it were. Everything is influenced by our own morals and our own beliefs. I'd agree completely. So, yeah, what gives me hope right now is the number of worlds in which princesses save princes or save other princesses, the number of worlds in which good prevails and yeah. good prevails over a complicated enemy. This is, this is no, you know, this is no paper enemy. This is a complicated enemy that represents things that are wrong in our world. And right. that artistic drive to share this message with the world through a hundred worlds, through a thousand novels, through a million RPG campaigns and Netflix series and movies that gives me hope because that tells me that every person who comes away from that movie and goes, wow, every person who comes away and shuts that novel and says, yes, that gives me hope. That's fantastic. That, wow. Yeah. That I couldn't, I couldn't have said it better. That's amazing. That's so, I feel you there. I really do. <laughs> By the time this airs, it will be November. <gasps> National Novel Writing Month will be in full swing. You guys are one of the sponsors for the event this year, as I recall. Yes, we are. We're, we're so excited to sponsor them because just like us, they're a lot older than we are, of course, as a, as a sort of a, as, as a thing. But um, one of the things that I love about them is that they were a sort of grassroots, tiny, tiny company, you know, just, just sort of coming up a company by accident, just like World Anvil was a company yeah. by accident. Um, and it's such a joy to, to work with them and sponsor them and see their passion um, and see the passion of the nano community as well. Like the World Anvil community is absolutely incredible, but the nano community is, is also incredibly supportive and wonderful. So, yeah, 
it's it's always always wonderful to be involved with those guys. That's cool. And uh, right after National Novel Writing Month, you guys have one of the big events that you do every year. And this is how I wet my feet in World Anvil's universe, which was World Ember. Tell the world about World Ember. So World Ember is, I guess it's, I guess it's quite inspired by NaNoWriMo, in fact. Instead of writing a novel that is 50,000 words, you write some world building. You write 10,000 words of world building. World building is less is less prosy often than than yeah. novel writing. So we figured, okay, 10k, especially if you've already done nano, is a good amount for a month. Um, mm-hmm. So you can world build whatever you want. You can world build for an RPG campaign. You can world build to you know document the world of the novel that you just pantsed your way through in November if you want to, or you know whatever you want. The idea is that you build your world 10,000 words strong. And it's such a great time. Our community comes out in force. They do write-ins. They do um, sprints. There's streams galore. There's so much sort of community support and all of that good stuff. And of course, we give away a bunch of prizes too. So we always have wonderful sponsors for these events because it helps us be able to give, you know, everybody who wins a chance to get a prize. So we will be doing this big prize draw of all the winners at the end. And we'll be giving away, again, thousands of dollars worth of books and RPG stuff and cool fantasy stuff and just just sort of wonderful things that we think the community will really, really enjoy. Because, you know, it's it's nice to get to give away stuff. It's Again, it's one of the perks of, of having a, a massive community is we can give fun stuff to them. And it gives me joy. Absolutely. That's awesome. I, I loved it last year. I had a great time. I was like, 10,000 words, bitch, please. I just did nano. I was, I had no idea. Right? World building is so much more involved in many ways because, you know, you need to present the art and then you need to think about how it interconnects to other aspects of whatever it is you're working on. And, you know, you got to do research to make sure that your technical information is accurate. And, you know, I, I did manage to, I think, squeak in with another 50,000 words of wow. building but it was uh yeah it was uh no I, I'm no 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 you well know there are people who are well doing beyond that what was 150,000 was it wasn't that Jamie yeah. Buffy who did that yeah we have some some ah, crazy so mind. it's worth mentioning we have a lot of people on World Anvil who are full-time authors who are experienced authors who have been authors for decades and uh do you know what they've practiced writing so they can write a lot really fast um, so yeah, some of our, some of our authors do top 150. I think our, our highest was 200 K, which is just, wow. even to me, who is a professional writer, like I can turn out 5 K a day. That's not a problem, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, 200,000 words. That person was writing on the toilet. I guarantee it. Like they were, there was not a break that they were having, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, no, it's a really good time. Yeah. And, um, we do prep stuff over over November as well. So if you're not taking part in NaNoWriMo, but you would like to uh, do World Ember, we will be releasing prep materials all through November on our blog and then, of course, through our social media, which is at World Anvil. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of support for preparing yourself because preparation is, of course, as with all things, one of the keys to success. So, uh, right. yeah, we'll be, we'll be giving, giving information about how to prepare yourself, how to prepare your world and, and have ideas and, you know, start thinking about collecting art and all of that good stuff. If I'd had Dimitri here, I would have talked to him about the fact that world building can be an art form in and of itself, right? Olaf Stapledon understood this way back when classic science fiction writer, um, he doesn't tell stories. He creates worlds. And he gives you a, a tour through them. But I mean, that that's the thing. And it's really valuable. I think you see a lot of that in World Ember and learn to really, you know, like, because you're looking at other people's work and, you know, you're getting ideas for your own work and, you know, giving feedback and getting feedback. And yeah, I, I just, I think it's awesome. It's worth mentioning that you can join World Anvil for free. Yes. Right. Um, you get more features, the uh, higher level tier you sign up for. It's a lot like a Patreon structure in that way, but it's regular fee. Um, but yeah, everything you actually um, must have, right? It's all in the free account. Yeah. If right? you just want to world build, if, if world building is what you want to do and you want to keep track of your world building, you can use World Anvil for free. And that was something that was always really important to us because we know that there are a lot of people out there now more than ever who 
who simply don't have the money for paid tools. So we wanted to give at least something for free, something that they could use, even even if they're not using it professionally, even if they're just a student and they, oh, just a student, even if they're a student and they don't have money and they, they're just world building because it's fun and they love it, you can use Wild Anvil for free forever. It's no question. Um, and again, the reason that we have a tiered structure is because some people want some functionality but can't afford a higher tier. And some people really want everything and use it as a professional grade tool. Yeah. And so, yeah, the tier structure reflects that. Basically, it 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 helps us give something for everyone and for every case, basically. And that's why we do it that way. And there is a lot of functionality on there in the higher tiers. My God. Yes. You can do a lot of things it's with insane. World Anvil. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Janet, thank you so much for doing this with me today. I really appreciate it. Tell people where to find you on the internet. Not like it's hard, but tell them where. <laughs> so if you go to worldanvil.com or even just Google World Anvil, you will find us. Uh, we are at World Anvil on all social media. And I would particularly point you towards our streams, which are really, really good fun. Not only because we're there with our cats and our buffoonery answering which writing and world building and World Anvil questions. And we'll give you live support if you need help with stuff but also because our community is wonderful and they hang out in the chat and they, they really make the streams um, like everything that you could possibly want from a community. Um, yeah, and you can find us at World Anvil pretty much across the board. And if you go to worldanvil.com forward slash writer, you will find, oh, sorry, I beg your pardon, author, you will find all of our features exclusively for authors or sorry, expressly, I should say rather for authors. So you can, you can, you know, check out the novel writing software, check out the software and see if it might be for you. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was so much fun. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This was awesome. And so that was our interview with Janet Forbes. That was really cool. She's pretty awesome. Isn't she? Yeah. Just a, a beacon of light in the world. I think. And just an all-around interesting person, too. Holy cow. She's had a pretty interesting life, for sure. Yeah. I mean, opera singer, daughter of archaeologist parents, now a business owner and writer. And, and like, uh -huh. not normal business, either. Like, a weird, no. you know, like, strange, modern, business, techie kind of thing. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It. Yeah, and, and the community is as important to the business model as the product itself, which mm. I love. There's so much out there. I mean, I'm so tired of corporate indifference and assholery. I, I just, you know, they do not care about you at all. You know, Google does not care about you. YouTube does not care about you. Walmart does not care about you. Amazon does not care about you, right? And, right. you know, but they care about you. Right. If you're involved in their community, they they care about you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, you could just tell from the way that she was talking about it. And, and man, what a like a um, runaway success story. That was crazy. A million Love users to hear that. Yeah, I know. Right. I, I just think it's awesome because when you hear of something that is like, I don't know, it's just good news. It's good news in a world that seems really dark in a lot of ways right now. But it gives me hope to know that you can have this dream and you can let other people in on the dream mm -hmm. and build a community around that dream. And that's good enough for success, for massive success. Yeah, yeah. I love what she said, too, about... Um how they're very transparent and genuine with all their, I don't know, users or followers or I don't know, however you phrase that, uh, you know, and like how they run the business with all the workers being personally invested in it and everything. And to me, that just seems like the model of how business should work. I would like to see more of it. I think it should be, I think it will be the wave of the future. Eventually, we're going to get tired of corporate indifference, and we're going to realize that we have the power to make our own dreams happen. We just have to work collectively with the right people. Right, right. Yeah, gosh, that would definitely be a more positive future than, than what we're seeing now, that's for sure. Things have got to break sometime, man. they got to. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, okay, well, do you... Um, 
Do you have any books you want to talk about? No, I haven't really had a lot of time for reading because I've been so concentrating on getting everything ready for National Novel Writing Month and our Game of Tomes event. And I just haven't had the time, but I've got a TBR list and I can't wait to start delving into it. It's probably going to have to wait till January, but I miss it and I'm looking forward to catching up. Yeah, yeah. See, I always joke with my friend, uh, who my very good friend from many, many years who's started writing lately. And he's like, I just don't have time to read anymore. I was like, dude, this is why I'm not a writer. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. You know, I I do most of my reading, like intense reading. Okay, honestly, I usually have something going. And I am still working my way slowly through the big book of science fiction. But I um, don't do a lot of intense reading unless I'm in a writing slump. And I haven't mm-hmm. been. So, but then, then I read like a mad woman, right? Right. I, yeah, so I, I feel it. You know, but sometimes, yes, months or even years will go by and I won't read a huge amount. And then I'll sit down and catch up on a, on a big stack of books. Oh, nice. I wish I was a faster reader. So I have to prepare ahead of time. Like I have to like, I like, well, and then, you know, me, I'm, I'm big into planning. So I plan out my list and what's going to come up next. Of course, you know, I have to have some flexibility with guests coming on and researching for them and stuff. But so for this episode, I do have one, one book. Um, and I have to have to full disclosure to everybody. Uh, the book is by a fellow named Rick Claypool, who was on our podcast, um, a couple episodes ago. And, um, the thing sure. about, well, why the, wouldn't you want to read the stuff our guests have written? I do. Sure. Sure. No, no. Well, the full disclosure part is, you know, like him and I hang out in real life. <laughs> sure. Or we did before, like, uh, before COVID happened. And then he just recently moved to, to Providence. So, Um, I have lots of friends I've made through writing and I still read their stuff. And I would, if their their stuff isn't good, I will just quietly, okay, if I don't think their stuff is good, because reading's subjective, right? Sure. If I don't think their stuff is good, I just won't say anything about it, right? Sure. If I think it's good, I'll still, you know, it's good. And that would be regardless of whether I knew them or not, so. Sure. No, then that that try to try to use that policy on here, but just want to let everybody know I'm not just talking about this book because he's my buddy. <laughs> cool. Well, tell me. Uh, yeah. So um, his first novel is called Leech Girl Lives. Oh and, yeah. Yeah. And, you were posting about that in the Discord. Yes. Yes, I was. Yes, I was. Yeah. Um, published by Space Boy Books in 2017, so it's a little bit of an older one, but definitely still current. Um, man, he is crazy. <laughs> so. Yeah. I guess um, you would describe it as gonzo, I think. Very wild, surrealistic, but also very fun and cartoony, but without abandoning serious commentary about the, you know, I'm gesturing around at the world now. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The story follows the the main character is Margot Chicago, and she's a safety inspector for the art safety department. So I guess she inspects art for safety. <laughs> uh, I love it. Yeah. Okay, got right, right, he's going right for the jugular and that absurdism right there. I love that stuff. Um, and by the time we get to her, you know, her boyfriend has already been thrown into the wasteland that surrounds their, their biodome. Essentially she has leech and she has leeches for arms. Um, and it just kind of goes from there and gets wilder and weirder. Uh, the book skips around a little bit. He plays with time. So he has got the chapter split into earlier and later <laughs> with the the first chapter being like the basis for what's earlier and later. Cool. Um, and it really allows him to lay out that story like one surprise at a time. And I love that feel. It's something that Todd A. Thompson does very well too, actually. So if you are really into absurdism, uh, cartoony pulp, kind of stuff and uh capitalist satire uh this book is definitely for you definitely check it out awesome all right so that's that's all i've got for this episode thanks to janet for coming on the show right absolutely thanks so much janet you were an awesome guest i really enjoyed that interview And if you all out there want to support us, you can find us on Facebook or Twitter. 
Uh, you can just you know type in if this goes on, don't panic, and we are there. You can also check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash if this goes on. We'd appreciate it if you can contribute. Uh, we have multiple tiers that you can pick from. Um, P. Jelly Clark was an author that our our Patreons have voted for. Uh, also, we are doing a little bit of a book giveaway right now. Uh, so that's happening as we speak. Um, so those are just two of the possibilities of being one of our patrons. So uh, please, please help us out. Yeah, exactly. Right. If I can put in a plug too for World Anvil, right. Um, by the time this airs, it's probably going to be pretty close to the end of the month of November, I imagine. Yep. Yep. That's and the plan. So, yeah. Yeah. So um, World Anvil does an event every year called World Ember. We mentioned it in the interview. It's a really great time to get involved in the community, check out what it's all about. You can start an account for free and, you know, check it out, right? If you're, if you're doing anything where you need world building, where you need to keep track of characters or locations or historical events, anything like that at all, really, it's awesome. And, you know, it's, it's a really welcoming place. So, you know, I, that's how I got involved in it was World Ember last year. And it's been just a ride ever since. Awesome. Oh, hey, I almost forgot our holiday episode. Oh, yeah. So for everybody out there, we are planning a holiday episode. Um, we don't have the exact date nailed down yet, but it will be sometime between Christmas and New Year's. We're going to be live streaming a holiday event and um, we would like you all to come and check it out. We're going to be bringing on previous guests to talk about some of their favorite things from the year. It's going to be an extended episode. It's going to be live on my Twitch channel. So that's Twitch TV slash Sable Aradia, S-A-B-L-E-A-R-A-D-I-A. And uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to talk about stuff and we're going to have some adult beverages. So we might be a little looser in tongue than we typically are. It's going to be more <laughs> cash. So <laughs> come hang out with us. It'll be fun. And if you miss it, it'll be up in the RSS feed soon after. So my children will probably be on at some point. It's going to be wild. <laughs> yeah, it's, it should be. It should be really good. <laughs> Well, thanks to everybody out there who listens. We appreciate uh, your time and your support. I guess we'll see you again next time. Awesome. See you again. If this goes on, Don't Panic is edited by Alan Bailey with production by Sound Maiden. Our theme music is by Father Flamethrower. Additional music is by Christopher Snydrowski. And outro music by Sable Aradia. Intro by Dave Robison. Special thanks to our guest, Janet Forbes. Thanks for supporting us, and we'll see you again soon.